I'm David Liu, and this is PMR Mythbusters. There are lots of things often taught in Polymyalgia Romatica that are not actually completely true. So today, let's bust this myth. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Mackey from Leeds in the United Kingdom. Hello, Sarah. Hello, David. So today's myth that we will be addressing is Polymyalgia Romatica is only proximal, so bilateral hips and buttocks, and our arms, shoulders. So, Sarah, let's say that I have a patient that comes in, classical presentation, both shoulders, both hips, prolonged early morning stiffness, elevated and inflammatory markers, but also has bilateral knee pain. Does that make them not polymyalgia aromatica? What do you think? No, it does not. That is a myth. Myth. It, it is a myth. Distal musculoskeletal manifestations are very common in polymyalgia rheumatica and knee pain is one of the commonest. So it is a myth. If it looks otherwise, just like PMR, that can still be PMR. So is it just the knee or does this extend to other peripheral sites as well? For example, the hands. What do we think about that? So um, absolutely, yes, it can. Um, so the commonest joints to be involved in terms of pain and swelling are knees and wrists, uh, but MCP joints are actually fairly commonly involved as well, and occasionally the ankles. And also we sometimes see a tina synovitis peripherally, so that can cause carpal tunnel manifestations. And of course, our favorite thing, RS3P as well, which is very peripheral too. So um, absolutely. The hands can also be quite symptomatic in PMR. And actually, if you ask a patient with PMR to shade where their pain is on a mannequin, some of them will actually, you know, restrict their shading to shoulders and hips very conveniently. And they might even show the ischial tuberosities and, and all of that if they're very, very accurate. But then some people are just going to colour in the whole of the mannequin and say, my whole body hurts, doctor. And, and it, for those, for some patients... They do have all over pain and all over stiffness, and there might be a bit of swelling in their knees as well. So how can we then, let me challenge you on this, if there is that difficulty knowing over, all over pain versus the pain directly from the polymyodramatica itself, how do we know that these are real sites of inflammation? Do, do the imaging studies tell us anything, for example? Absolutely. So... Um, Clearly, in our clinical diagnostic process, we do take a history and the patient may say they have pain all over. And that may be absolutely what they experience. And of course, we're going to examine them and we will quite frequently find restriction of movement, particularly at the proximal joints around the hip, shoulder and hip girdles. And that's fine. And we also might find corroborative labs. They may have systemic features and so on and so forth. But then sometimes the picture is not 100 percent clear cut. And that's when we want to move to um, imaging. And there have been some great imaging studies. So you can do ultrasound, you can do MRI scans, particularly of the pelvis. Um, you can do PET CT, you can do PET MRI. Um, and all of these um, Im imaging studies, um, they show that PMR actually is a very distinct disease. It has its own signature. Um, that signature looks slightly different depending on the imaging modality in terms of exactly the appearance of the structure, but it's the pattern of structures which is the same no matter what imaging modality you use. Um, PET scans, quite frequently, we do half body PET scans. So we cut the PET scan off above the knee. But actually, if you do whole body PET CT, you will quite frequently see involvement um, of the knee joints. Um, and that's probably because of the popliteal tendon in the back of the knee and the tend tendonitis, peritendonitis characteristic of, of PMR, which is part of its signature. So um, absolutely, patients do have knee pain and swelling quite frequently. They've got every reason to experience that knee pain and swelling. And it's part of the PMR and it should respond to the steroids in exactly the same way. So let me challenge you a little bit further on this. Some people would say, well, if you've got both shoulders involved, both hips involved, both knees involved, this has to be a oligoarticular or polyarticular large joint inflammatory arthritis, a rheumatoid arthritis, let's say. What would you say to that? Well, there's two things to that. There's one thing is what you can draw your disease boundaries where you like. Um, but then the second thing is, if you look at that PET-CT scan, 
those two conditions look very different. So the RA is very synovial centered. It sits in that synovium. The inflammation is focused onto the joint cavity. Um, Whereas in PMR, there is fluid inside the joint, but that's secondary. And primarily it's inflammation is extra capsular. It's around the outside of the joint. Um, So it's a very, very different pattern. Um, And it can be look quite similar clinically, but if you're not sure, you can get some sort of imaging and that will often help you decide. Um, I don't tend to use imaging very much for PMR diagnosis because actually when you've seen quite a lot of PMR, it, you know, the clinical ev- evaluation is usually sufficient, um, but sometimes it's a bit less clear and then I will go on and get imaging. And so do we often see this pr- these peripheral, um, this peripheral involvement persist along uh, in amongst in terms of the disease activity that we do get? Or does it tend to um, does it tend to operate independently, or does it operate uh, as part of a broader system? So it's um, it's most common at presentation. It tends to respond to steroids, um, but then if the PMR relapses, then sometimes these distal musculoskeletal manifestations can relapse along the way. Um, possibly partly dependent on you know, how quickly that relapse is caught, the longer you leave it, the more it's going to spread. So um, sometimes you do, but you predominantly see these um, distal manifestations at at, at the onset. Um, And in the really good PMR studies, they followed uh, the PMR patients up for five years just to make sure it doesn't evolve into rheumatoid arthritis. Um, And we can be very confident if they've done that, that what they're describing genuinely is PMR. If you do get a peripheral joint that gets more and more synovitic as time goes on and everything else is is fine, and then these peripheral small joints start to get involved, then you might get a little worried that, in fact, it was PMR um, initially. uh, PMR um, being uh, mimicked by rheumatoid arthritis. But that's actually fairly unusual in this day and age. We're quite good at picking out rheumatoid arthritis early because we've got lots of skills in that in rheumatology. Um, and it's usually, if it looks just like PMR with a little bit of peripheral joint swelling, then it usually is going to turn out to behave just like PMR if you follow them up for five years. So my patient with the shoulder and hip stiffness, prolonged early morning stiffness in the morning, but knee pain does actually have PMR, doesn't have uh, a funny looking rheumatoid arthritis. If it looks otherwise like PMR, then I think it's very, very valid to um, proceed as you suggest and follow them up and just make sure it does behave like PMR is expected to behave. So there you go. PMR isn't only proximal so it can be more than just the hips and the shoulders uh good learning point i think that's one thing that we often hear taught that's not absolutely completely true so today we've busted that myth thanks and join me for another pmi myth busters coming up soon thank you very much